reading from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37. The hand of the Lord came upon me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord, and set me down in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them, and there were very many lying in the valley, and they were very dry. He said to me, Mortal, can these bones live? And I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O oh dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you, and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you, and cause flesh to come upon you, and cover you with skin, and put breath in you, and you shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I'd been commanded, and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked, and there were sinews on them, and flesh had come upon them, and skin had covered them, and there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy mortal, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain, that they may live. I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they lived, and stood on their feet, a vast multitude. Then he said to me, Mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up, and our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live and I will place you on your own soil. Then you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken and will act, says the Lord. And a reading from the book of Acts, Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rushing of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages, as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at the sound the crowd gathered and were bewildered, because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all of these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them. Peter, uh, people of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for only, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, 
that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young people shall see visions, and your old men and women shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And a reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, chapter 15. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who comes from the Father, the Spirit will testify on my behalf. You also are to testify, because you have been with me from the beginning. This is the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, Knox people, Kimara Harship, which is what the First Minister of Knox Church would have said to his friends, meaning, how are you? The response being, ha guma, as Alison told me. So, Kimara Harship, ha. Pentecost breaking out even in Knox Church. None of us, I presume, takes the story of Pentecost in a literal sense. We don't believe that people had flames over their heads, that folk of countless different languages chatted together in some form of divine Esperanto. We know that this is figurative stuff, the language of prophecy, of empowerment. Language, as every biblical scholar knows, is not the outer clothing of thought and values. The way we speak goes to the heart of who we are. Metaphor is the high road to all philosophy. And we forget too soon, too often, that Jesus, the Shenachi, the storyteller, that Paul, the smart talker, that the early church developed all a quite new language which came into the tired classical world in literary terms. The Gospels and Paul are quite amazing, chaperoning a brand new vocabulary for life, death, faith, hope, charity. And in the fourth century with Augustine, his confessions, a new genre becomes possible, that of biography, where we can talk about ourselves, who we are. So a new language is the key to a new humanity. So that we're no longer talking by one another, but to one another. Friends, we think too little about language. It's so crucial. Bad language is not swearing. Swearing is quite useful. Bad language is jargon. It's talking in cliches. It's professional jargon, religious jargon, sentimental claptrap. Good language is what makes us humans human. Now, here in Knox, we have lots of languages. We have the language of the organ, which brackets this whole service and takes us out of ourselves. We have the language of hymns, 
which enables us to feel things which we cannot express in words alone. We have the language of anthems, that marvelous kick in the posterior that the choir gives us, shaking the very rafters of our psyche with their soaring sopranos and booming bass, and often our marvelous children's choir. And now and then, too, when he's inspired, Jordan treats us to a new musical way and to prayer, a new language. And of course, there's the language of the sermon, which is so different, I believe, from a lecture or a talk, because it makes the outrageous and bone-chilling claim that here we're talking of God. We're talking of the sacred, of the numinous. And finally, of course, we have the language, perhaps the most eloquent language of all, <laughs> the language of silence. So we in Knox do speak in tongues. And Pentecost, as Jordan has been saying, Pentecost personifies all that's different to the story of Babel in the Old Testament, when humans got above themselves and communication chaos broke in. Pentecost is finding, recovering a new language, a good language. Today, as we look around the world, we're closer to Babel, are we not, than to Pentecost. Look at the USA, two countries split down the middle, CNN and Fox News, no common language. Look at Jerusalem, Jews, Israelis with their huge history of suffering, and Arabs with their history of suffering, and unable to talk to one another. Look at ourselves in the church, caught so often in a churchy language, which for most Kiwis, I think, our religious talk seems like gobbledygook. It's a sort of hermetic code which they can't break. So Pentecost is about the discovery, the recovery of language. Perhaps the most precious gift we have Poets and artists remind us how hard it is to find the right word, the right image, the right metaphor. Here's the marvelous Jesuit poet, Gerald Manley Hopkins, who sees a falcon riding the air My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing, the falcon, a symbol of the spirit, what is it that stirs us in the very abyss, the hiddenness of our hearts? Because our generation faces quite incredible, terrible challenges to the environment, to democracy, which is crumbling all over the place, to global health, the yawning gap between rich and poor. It feels like Babel. It is Babel. And with these 
apocalyptical challenges before us. We in the church face theological challenges too. <laughs> when I started in my ministry uh, approximately 500 years ago, <clears throat> you could take it for granted. It was easy to be radical because you could take it for granted that 90% was there, was foundational, and you could feel brave challenging the virgin birth or Jesus' physical resurrection. But today, everything seems in question. So where can we even begin in the church? Facing down death by the Nazi hangman facing down the terrible humiliation and shame of the Germany he loved so much. <clears throat> Dietrich Bonhoeffer, in his wonderful letters and papers from prison, turned to poetry. Wonderful, wonderful stuff. Von guten Mächten wunderbar geborgen, kept safe and sound, by the power of good, we'll face whatever lies ahead. Erwarten wir getrost, was kommen mag. God is with us from dawn to darkness and for sure on each new day. <clears throat> Extraordinary language of poetry. despairing of a church mired in piety and sentiment and natural fearfulness. Bonhoeffer set about forging a new language. Here we go. What distinguishes Christians is that they stand by God in his suffering. Being Christian is not about being religious, but being Christ to others in this world. We have to learn to speak of God, Bonhoeffer says, in a non-religious way. We might say in a non-churchy way. unless you're crying out on behalf of the Jews. Abandon talking about God at all. <clears throat> and so I, I believe that we in the church are Bonhoeffer people or we're nothing. Because like him, we encounter, if we eyes are open, we encounter radical evil every time we look at TV. David Attenborough recently, everything, everything precious in our culture is now threatened with extinction by the climate crisis that we refuse to take seriously. <clears throat> so there's no easy words, no easy language for all this still less easy answers or actions. Yet here in Pentecost, as the kaitiaki of 3,000 years of Judeo-Christian prophetic agony and ecstasy, we have to look again at our Pentecostal calling to find a new language for life and love. And I believe we can make a beginning, forge a language of resistance inch by inch. <laughs> and I do hope that what I'm saying here is not some pulpit rhetoric, because I really believe this, that without the sort of empowerment, without 
the fierce fire in the belly, without the raging wind of the Spirit, which Pentecost talks about, we will just crumble in the face of the challenges we face. David White, with a Y, David White, Canadian poet. <clears throat> this is not the age of information. This is not the age of information. Forget the news and the radio and the blurred screen. This is the time of loaves and fishes. People are hungry. And one good word is bread for a thousand. People are hungry. And one good word is bread for a thousand. <clears throat> when I uh, get too black and depressed looking at the state of things, I think of the wonderful colleagues I had in the East German church under communism who won hearts over because of their down-to-earth language, their Sachlichkeit, their nailing of reality, their edgy integrity of life and language. And it was this which enabled them with gutsy allies in culture and politics to facilitate the unbelievable miracle of 1989, the collapse of the Berlin Wall, ohne Gewalt, without violence, unbelievable. So it's possible. <laughs> and I know that this is scary stuff, that we're ordinary folk here, we're no Bonhoeffers or Martin Luther Kings. But I think that in Knox, we're already beginning to explore, are we not? A new angular language in our praying and our preaching, in our daily work and living, in the submission we've just made to the Commission on Climate Change, in the recent motion we brought to synod going on to assembly. So let's continue to be bold, to explore gently but determinedly what being angular means in this smooth culture of ours. My heart in hiding, stirred for a bird, the achieve of the mastery of the thing. <clears throat>